here. Okay. So si since Monday, I've talked to an, a great many of you about the problems that and the issues, you know, understandings and misunderstandings and all that. And, but cooking is such a part of life, and th this, this, th these particular topics, water, steam, and ice, that it's worth trying to do them as carefully as I can to try to convey as much of the understandings as I can so that you can use it, because it's, you know, it, it, it's so directly useful. Um, so I'm going to, I'll spend the rest of the day, I'm not going to get into clothing insulation yet, although those are useful too, but, but I'll really focus on trying to get it across these issues with, with uh, heat and water, steam, and ice. First thing that, that to, to, to try to help people understand uh, further is this idea that what we see with our eyes is all in terms of visible light. And, and where, I'm, where I'm headed is what things look like in the infrared and, and why. And just to, to remind you that what you're, what you're seeing when you're, right now we're, we're looking at each other and, and, and various things, you're seeing the reflection of visible light. The, the sources of visible light are specific identifiable things. The, the ceiling lights and there are a few other ones. The projector light is an is a actual source of, of light. And everything else in here is, is passive. It's not creating light, but it's taking light that hits it and sending it out in various directions, or maybe not. And things that appear black to us are things that absorb visible light, and therefore, even when illuminated, illuminated by visible light, nothing comes back off them. So they, so they appear black to us. We call them black because whatever light, visible light hits them, doesn't, it, it's gone. It's a, a, absorbed, not seen again. So that's, that's, uh, that's the sense of, of blackness. Things that are white send light back, all colors equally. So that the, the, the reds, the blue, the whole, the whole rainbow spectrum comes blasting right back off a white surface. And uh, it loses information about where the light originally came from, but it's, it's all coming back for practical purposes. Shiny actually remembers where the light came from. And not only does it give you all the light back, but it gives you information about it. Metallic shiny, silver. So far, so good? Um, in the infrared, when we look at surfaces in the inf infrared, suppose we, we turn on an infrared light bulb. And there are different parts of the infrared. And so let's just imagine we, we not, not worry about the details of what the infrared spectrum looks like. If we turn on an infrared light bulb, and we suddenly could see infrared light, the infrared light bulb would be illuminating the whole room, all those things. Some things would send light back, some things wouldn't. And some things, so some things would look dark because they don't reflect light something and absorb it. And some things would look light because they send light out in various ways. They look you know, white-ish or shiny-ish. It turns out that virtually everything in this room, when illuminated by infrared light, absorbs it. It doesn't come back out. So even though they look white to our eyes, in visible light, when illuminated with infrared light, the light doesn't light sticks. It doesn't come back. So pretty much everything in this room absorbs f deep infrared that is far from the visible, the portion of the, of the spectrum that's really associated with thermal, uh, the, the thermal radiation for objects at our temperatures. Everything looks black, with the exception of, of metallic things, things that conduct electricity. They can look shiny and reflective. And examples that, so I, so I brought, you know, these just there are lots of photographs of, of, on the web of um, thermal images. This is obviously a cat. And what you're seeing is not the reflection of the cat when illuminated with infrared light. It's a, it's a different possibility. It's turn off all the lights and look at the cat's actual thermal radiation. And the cat glows. And it, it's false color. The, the colors here, uh, they don't mean the colors that we see with our eyes. They're just the, the brighter, yellower part is, is just simply glowing. It's hotter, I believe. So the, 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 the temperature is uh, associated with color. The cat's eyes are the warmest thing that you see. And the cat's fur is cooler, but not the same temperature as the room. The room is the, the background would presumably be the, the coolest thing in here. And they've false colored it as, as dark. So the cat's fur is, is glowing with, with thermal radiation. It's a little warmer than the, than the room, and the cat's eyes, the, the warmest thing there. You OK with that idea? We have no idea what color this cat is when illuminated by visible light. 
It could be a white cat. It could be a black cat. Anything in between. There's no information here about that. This is simply the thermal information coming from, from the, the cat. And the cat's fur, regardless of its visible light color, is going to be pretty black and glowing as brightly as it can with its temperature, with its thermal radiation. Um, so that's a cat. Um, where's, where's Bunny? Here's Bunny. Same idea. The bunny's got various uh, temperatures depending on where along the bunny's fur. And the bunny's ears are the warmest thing, probably because they have relatively little fur. And you're actually seeing the warm, the warm bunny ear skin and the bunny's eyes. Right? We, again, have no idea what color this bunny is in, at, uh, in visible light. It could be a, a black bunny, white bunny, pink bunny. Questions about this idea? I mean, you get all the questions during office hours and stuff, but, but you know, it's, people are reluctant to ask during class, and I haven't kept up the... But, but if you don't understand it, ask me about it. So these things in our temperature range, room temperature, human temperature, even cooking temperature to some extent, they emit thermal radiation that is so far in the infrared that we can't judge temperature. We, ah, we can't judge color well there. Color being ability to, uh, uh, on a range of, of the grayscale from, from white to black, we can't judge it by looking. We have to use machines to judge it. And it, you, look, you start looking around, you discover, oh, pretty much everything's black. Um, so that's, that's I have worked over the years on trying to show or photograph charcoal. Charcoal is black, right? You buy it at the store, it's black. And you light it on fire, and it glows red. It's black stuff glowing red. And my dream has always been to take a flash photograph of the glowing red charcoal, the red, you know, the red hot charcoal, and show you that when illuminated by external light, visible light, it's black. It absorbs all the light you expose it to. So that's, that's what black is. It absorbs all the light that you expose it to. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have any light coming off of it. It just means it doesn't reflect any light. It emits its own thermal radiation, for sure. And when it's red hot, it's glowing with its own thermal radiation, which is red. It includes red. It's, it's mostly infrared, but it includes red. The, the idea OK? The reality is, every time I have done this, there's always so much ash present on the, on the surface of the burning charcoal. And ash, is, it's not carbon, it's, it's minerals and stuff. And it doesn't look black. It's gray, and it, it reflects light. So when I do the flash photograph, you see the stupid ash. And it spoils the perfection of the, 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 my dream. So I want to try to burn pure carbon, no ash. It should be black when you look at it but glowing red hot uh, with its own heat. And anyway, someday I'll get this to pull up. I, I have pure carbon in many forms in my, in my lab, and I've tried heating up a chunk of pure carbon. You can't get it to burn. It's so dense and stuff, you, it doesn't burn. Uh, much disappointment. But, you, but, you, but next time you see wood burning or, or charcoal burning, realize that you're looking at a black object that's glowing with its own thermal radiation. Shine a flashlight at it. No light comes back. It's black. Questions? OK. So that's my story of, of infrared light to go back. Now back to uh, uh, well, almost a water seam and ice. This is a photograph of the inside of an electric oven. It happens to be, as we'll see, a, a forced convection oven if it wants to be. But, but come to that later. So this is all you know, the problems that, you, that hopefully just finished. This is all about that. You should understand what's going on in the oven. Modern electric ovens, most ovens are electric. Even if you have a gas burner on top, you probably have an electric oven itself. And those ovens have at least two el heating elements in them, one at the bottom, one at the top. And they cook differently. And I hope you figured this out. The one at the bottom, which in this case, so here's the bottom. Um, it actually has a cover over it. And I guess they've cut away the cover. But there's the element sitting at the bottom. A lot of ovens just have the element right there for you to see and touch, I ideally not touch with anything that matters because it's really hot. Um, that element radiates off thermal radiation like crazy, and it also heats the local air, which then becomes buoyant. It's hot air rises because of natural buoyancy. You, it, 
it, it, uh, its pressure never changes. Its pressure stays at atmospheric pressure even as you heat it. And for that to happen, the air has to become less dense as you heat it. It's, the molecules spread out to occupy more volume uh, because they're hotter. Each one's contributing more to pressure. You don't need as many. So they spread out. It becomes lighter than the surrounding cooler air, and up it goes. So, so this element heats, heats air, which then rises upward because of natural buoyancy. So OK with everybody? It goes around your food. It transfers heat to the food. Cool, the air then cools off, goes back down to pick up more heat, floats back up with the fresh heat over and over, assuming you don't obscure the, its passage by putting too much stuff in the oven. That's a, always a potential problem. You put in, a, you know, you're cooking for thousands and you shove everything in possible. You know, Thanksgiving, don't completely obscure the, the airflow. You won't get proper cooking anymore. Uh, so, so food in here gets cooked by, by moving air, rising up, carrying heat with it as convection, also by radiation, because this bottom surface just is bathing the whole top of the stove in thermal radiation. Everything up here gets, gets uh, heated by thermal radiation, unless it's incredibly shiny, and that's unlikely. The top element's different. The broiler element, it heats the air around it. What happens to the air around it? It becomes buoyant, and it goes up. Well, it's already at the top of the oven. This is, this is the same physics as when I was heating the test tube full of water, holding the bottom of the test tube and heating the top of the test tube. Yeah, you can boil the water up there. It gets hot. It becomes buoyant. The water floats up. It's already at the top of the test tube. It floats up. It's already at the top of the test tube. Nothing happens. Same thing here. You heat the air. It gets hot. It becomes buoyant. It's lifted up to the top. It's there. It just stays there. Nothing interesting happens. So you don't cook with convection. You cook with radiation alone. So that this, this element up here is just bathing the food below it with, with uh, thermal radiation, primarily line of sight, just, just a straight shot right at the surface. There's some bouncing off, off of the smooth, shiny surfaces in here a little bit that also contributes. Basically, straight shot. If you obscure it with aluminum foil, for example, uh, that, that downward bathing radiation, you can prevent certain parts of your tofu turkey or whatever you have in there on Thanksgiving, you can prevent parts of it from getting that thermal radiation and cooking as fast. So this is the strategies of trying to decorate parts. When you're, if you're using both burners and stuff, you, you, can de uh, you can use aluminum foil strategically to, to slow down thermal radiation as a cooking means. Any, any questions about everything I've said so far about the oven? Code of silence continues. Third, last thing here. You notice that, that widget in the background there? That's a fan. This, this is a so-called convection oven, which is a misnomer. It should really be called a forced convection oven. This oven has a, a third cooking possibility. You can bake, you can broil, and you can turn on the convection system. The convection system has its, probably has its own heating element. May, I guess it may or may not. Um, but it stirs the air deliberately with a fan. It doesn't wait for natural convection to, to gradually lift the, the hot air upward. It just stirs the bejeebers out of the air inside the oven, and that means that everything in the oven, including your overstuffed cookie sheets, gets bathed in hot air at the temperature that you've chosen. And so the cooking's more even. There are no, there are no hot spots and cold spots in the oven and so on. So it's the, sort of the modern... It's a good thing. I mean, it's, it, it, it improves cooking um, in most cases. So that's a story of an oven. Any, any questions? I guess I, I should also point out that these elements, although you can see them glowing red hot right now, they're, they're like thousand, I mean, a thousand plus watts of electric power is going into them. They're emitting a fraction of a watt of visible light, just a tiny bit of visible light. My, my, my laser pointer, or you know, a, certainly a flashlight, is brighter in terms of just illumination than those. So they're emitting very little visible light. It's almost all in the infrared. They're, if you could see the infrared, they would just be super bright. And that's what's cooking. You're cooking with infrared. All right. With that, then, I'll leave. Uh, so this is more the story of, of transferring heat and so on. And now I can go back.
to, to, to the world of, of water and all of its friends, or at least close, actually close relatives. And what I want to make sure that you understand by the time all the dust settles here is, is these phase transitions and phase equilibria. Phase transitions are when one of the material phases converts in, in part or, or entirely into another phase. Solid goes to liquid, liquid goes to gas, solid goes to gas, and vice, you know, all these vice versa. Those are the phase transitions. Phase equilibrium is when two phases, or maybe more, are s existing simultaneously and neither one is growing uh, at the expense of the other. So the ice isn't melting to become water, the water isn't freezing to become ice. They're just sitting there together happy as a clam. And that, that can happen. You can have phase equilibria between water and ice, between ice and gas, whatever you want to call gas, steam or water vapor, and between the ice and the steam or water vapor. They, they, all, they all happen, but the rules that govern them are maybe a, not so complicated, but they're complicated if you memorize them as just details, but if you understand why they happen, uh, you should be able to sort of resurrect them, re recreate the rules uh, in your own head. And so where things sort of stand in my discussion, I, and I, got, I apologize, I got behind my problem set. So some of the questions of the problem set anticipated uh, things I hadn't yet taught. Ah, it's just, I, you know, it, it is what it is. Going back to ice and water. As with any phase, uh, two, any system where there are two phases present simultaneously, there's action at the interface between the two. There are molecules leaving one phase to the other and vice versa. And for these specific phases, solid ice and liquid water, the rates at which their particles are leaving them depends on a, a certain things. For the ice, the rate at which water molecules leave the ice depends primarily on the ice's temperature. Why? Because it, it takes energy to break a, a water molecule free from the ice. That energy is, is, no, is known as the latent heat of, of melting or, or fusion, officially. So it takes energy to, 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 to free up the molecules so that instead of being stuck in this ice crystal, they're able to move in ice water. So there's an energy investment. And you need, a, you need a, below a certain temperature that the freeing up becomes so rare, it almost never happens. And above, as, as you go up in temperature, that, that freeing up becomes more and more possible. It's statistical. It's, a, it's the molecules trying to get more than their fair share of the local energy, of the local thermal energy. And occasionally they do, and they break free. So, so as temperature goes up, the rate at which water molecules leave ice for gaseous water, ah, liquid water, uh, increases. So, OK? The rate at which liquid I, uh, water molecules leave the liquid water for the ice depends primarily on how often they hit. And that's determined entirely by uh, the density of the water, which is un inflexible. It's, it's a certain value. That's all you got to work with. So the water molecules, the rate at which they land on the ice and stick is, is pretty much a, is, uh, a set rate. You don't have a lot of, con there's not, not much you can do to change it, although I'll, I'll, I'll say two cents. Uh, in a minute. So, so if, if, if increasing temperature increases the rate at which water molecules leave the ice, and, and not, sort of nothing affects the rate at which water molecules leave the water for the ice, there, they'll come up, there, there are sort of two ranges, two extremes. If you're really cold, the ice is going to rarely lose a water molecule, and the liquid water molecules are going to land on the ice at their steady rate and you're going to grow the ice. So when it's really cold, the ice is going to get bigger and bigger and take over. D did you follow that? A question? You know, ask me a, was it follow? Okay. When it's really cold, you get the landing. The landing wins and, and you get ice. When it's really hot, the leaving becomes very fast and it wins. The ice shrinks, the liquid water grows. There's one special temperature in between, the melting temperature of, of ice, freezing temperature of water, same thing, at which they're in balance. The rate at which water molecules leave the ice at that temperature matches the rate at which water molecules leave the liquid water for ice, and you can have the two, the two just sit there forever, happy, phase equilibrium.
And that's the situation in a glass of water, uh, a glass of ice water. If you, if you start with just a glass of ice right out of the freezer, it's very cold ice, like I made last time. And that ice has no water, no liquid water in it. And it has to warm up for a while because any droplet of water that might by chance appear on this ice at that low temperature is going to very quickly turn into ice because it's going to land more often than the water molecules re replenish. Uh, the water molecules from the liquid water will land more often than they are replenished, and the liquid water will shrink away to nothing. That, that, that. Yes. So Maddie's question is about the, if the rate at which water molecules land on the ice is sort of a steady, steady process, how can you flash freeze something? How can you, how can you make it freeze, in, in effect, faster than that rate? Does, does that rate limit how quickly you can freeze the ice? And, and probably, I think the answer, the answer is no, and the reason is because when I say that the landing rate is pretty fixed, it is true that the rate at which they hit is fixed, but the rate at which they stick, the, the, the chances of them sticking when they hit does depend on temperature secretly. I'm trying to sweep that under the rug, but, but if you make it cold enough, every water molecule that hits the ice surface sticks to it, never, it doesn't rebound. And ultimately you get very rapid hitting and, ver and, and everyone sticks, the ice freezes very quickly. Is that okay? So I'm, what, I, what I guess I'm trying to do is, is, is simplify the world into the, key, into the main features. The main rate limiter in water leaving the ice is temperature. The main rate lim limiter in ice, in water leaving the, molecules leaving the water for the ice is the density of the water. To a minor extent, temperature too. Is that okay? Uh, when you then start with, li with solid ice and you warm it up, you, the water just can't, can't appear. It, it, if it did appear, it would, it would, the freezing, it, the landing would win and they you would end up with turning that liquid water into ice. If you go hot enough, the leaving process wins and you can't have ice around because if you did, it's going to, water molecules are going to leave its surface for the liquid water and it's going to melt. Right at the middle, you can have both. And if you, if you add heat, starting with very cold ice, you, you just steadily add heat to the system. When it's pure ice, the only thing that heat can do is make the ice warmer, increase its temperature. So initially the temperature goes up when you start heating ice, just as like when you're, if you were heating a, a rock, anything, uh, any, any solid object, you add heat to it, its temperature increases, simple. Uh, the same happens when all you've got is water left in the container after everything's melted. You add heat to it, temperature goes up. That's all it can do with the, with the, the heat. Um, at the point where, where you simultaneously have water and ice, strange thing. You add heat to that, and instead of the heat, the temperature, the heat going into increasing the temperature of that mixture, it goes into melting the ice into water. The energy goes in there. You might think that it, it, that it should be sort of split between these two effects, partly going into heating the, the, uh, the mixture and to its, so its temperature goes up, and partly uh, to melt some fraction of the solid ice into liquid water. It, it's very hard to get the temperature to, to deviate very much from the melting freezing temperature of water because that transition is so effective at using the heat or you know, interacting with the heat that it wins. It, get, it gobbles up all the heat you add, and it provides all the heat you take, replaces all the heat you take out if you try to freeze the, if you, if you, so if you're, if you're trying to melt the ice by adding heat, all the heat goes into melting. If you're trying to freeze the ice by taking heat out, all the heat comes out of freezing. The process of freezing ice releases thermal energy and, and uh, you, get the, you, get the, you get the heat you invested, when you have to invest heat to melt ice, you get that heat back out when you freeze water. So in any case, while the, while the two are, are 
in the process of either melting or freezing, the temperature is, is self-regulating. You, you have great trouble pushing the temperature of that mixture far away from the melting or freezing temperature. A tiny bit, but that's all you get. So the temperature is pretty much rock solid while, it's, while they're both present, which is why when you have a glass of ice water uh, at, at, at the restaurant, it's always the same temperature. It's always the melting, freezing temperature of water. Okay? You, the one place where you can influence this temperature, you can't, you know, don't, you can't mess with the ice. The ice is, is a crystal and solid all, all by itself. You can't add or subtract anything from it, at least once it's been made. But you can add or subtract stuff to the water. And if you put things into the water that reduce the landing rate so that the water molecules have more trouble landing on the ice and, and, and maintaining the balance, you will tend to push down the temperature of the mixture. So if you add salt, sugar, alcohol, um, all of these things mess up the water's ability to land its water molecules on the ice and maintain that side of the balance. As a result, you end up melting more of the ice into the water uh, and driving down the temperature until it becomes hard enough, until it becomes harder for water molecules to break free of the ice and thereby balance the, now, you've got a slower landing rate, you have to match it with a slower leaving rate from the ice by going colder. So adding anything that dissolves uh, or, or dilutes water will push down the temperature of this mixture. You okay with that? All right. Um, zero Fahrenheit, incidentally. Now what sets the zero of the Fahrenheit scale? It's a, it's a particular mixture of a, of a weird salt with water. You add enough, uh, yes, you, you add enough salt to an ice water mixture. Uh, you make it so hard for the, for the water molecules to land on the ice that the ice has to go very cold before, it, before uh, the, break, the, the leaving rate matches that rare, rare landing rate, and you get zero Fahrenheit. So that's, that's where they defined zero Fahrenheit, was by, by, by salting a, an ice water mixture. And you know about salting an ice water mixture for making uh, ice cream and stuff. You can push down the temperature of that mixture by tying up the water molecules, making it harder for them to land. Questions? Try, yeah, Nick. How much salt does it require to reach that temperature? How much salt does it require for you to get to that point? Um, I think at that point you're getting close to a, the saturated amount, of, uh, saturated water. You're putting as much salt in the water as the water is willing to hold. So that's um, pretty salty, you know, really, seriously salty. Uh, Seawater, for example, has, it, has trouble freezing. That, that it, it reaches that balance of, of, of uh, ice and seawater. It's colder than, than the, the freezing melting temperature by a couple of degrees, but you go seriously salty, like, like uh, Great Salt Lake salty and stuff. Now, now, that, now it's not, you're down near you're zero Fahrenheit to get that, the coexistence of the ice and that super salty water. Okay? But Fahrenheit's defined for some weird salt. It's not sodium chloride, I forget what it is, some other, some other salt. Um, but anything that dissolves in the water will do it. Salt is not sp so special. Sugar will do it. I mean, you, you want to melt the ice on your, your, on your walkway, you don't have any salt. Uh, sugar's not as, eff as efficient for interesting reasons, but you can melt the ice with sugar. Okay? Sand will not do it because sand doesn't dissolve. The water ignores it. it it's just nothing. It's a nothing. Okay, so this is the water ice, uh, the liquid water, solid ice, those transitions. I hope I've got those across pretty well. How about if you have, I, I, I'm, I'm actually going to leave, well, see, do I have a d decent slide to put up here while I'm talking about? Yeah, this is, this is okay. Um, yeah, can steam co uh, exist below? The boiling temperature of water, and the answer is yes. We're breathing it right now. I, uh, some time ago, I asked you how much water there is in this air, this room air, and it's about 2%. So when they list the contents of, of the Earth's atmosphere, they ignore the water. Uh, don't forget it's there. <laughs> it's quite important in many, many ways. So, so there's there is water vapor in the air. It's, it's diluted by other 
what are often called permanent gases, that is, things that, that don't undergo condensation. They don't, be, they don't make any interesting transitions to liquids or solids in our normal experience. Uh, yes, you can make liquid nitrogen, but it's, a, it's, it's for fun, you know, it's for other, you gotta work at it. Okay, so when you have a container of water and it's exposed to open space, whether the open space happens to have air molecules in it or not, doesn't make a huge difference. There will be an action at the surface of that liquid water. There will be water molecules leaving the liquid for the gas, and there will be water molecules leaving the gas for the liquid. Back and forth, busy airport, up, you know, landings and leavings all the time. And the dominant effects for the landings and leavings, the, the liquid water uh, loses, water molecules leave the liquid water primarily uh, based on temperature. The hotter it is, the more likely it is for a liquid water molecule to find the remarkably large amount of energy it needs to break free. That the energy it needs to break free from liquid water to become gaseous water is called the latent heat of evaporation or vaporization officially. And that's a lot of, it takes a lot of energy to break water molecules free of the liquid and send them off as gas. So the, the leaving rate, the rate at which water molecules leave the liquid for the gas is determined primarily by temperature. The higher the temperature, the, the faster they leave. The easier it is for them to get the energy they need to break free and head off, okay? The landing rate is, is, has a lot to do with density, but now the water, unlike water, which has a fixed density, gaseous water has a, a variable density. You can pack the water molecules tightly, not tightly, anything you like. So the rate at which water molecules return from the gas to the liquid is, is, is wildly flexible. And therefore, you can reach phase equilibrium, where the, where the leaving rate matches the landing rate, at any temperature you like. If it's cold and you want to make the, th this balance occur, well, you notice that it's, it's, it's the rate at which water molecules are leaving the liquid water is, is quite slow, because they have trouble getting the thermal energy they need to break free. So if you want to match that slow leaving rate with the landing rate, you have to make the landing rate slow. How do you do that? Don't have many water molecules in the gas, just a few. And if there's no air, then it's very low pressure. So you make, so that the balance can, can be struck and you can have the water sit there and the gas sit there and nobody's growing at the expense of the other. They're exchanging molecules, but, but neither phase gets bigger at the expense of the other. If it's hot and the leaving rate for water molecules going off the surface is fast, then you have to match it by landing them fast. How do you do that? Have a dense water vapor above, above the, the, the liquid. Heavy steam, okay? So at low temperatures, the balance is struck when there are not very many water molecules present. At high temperatures, the balance is struck when they have lots of water molecules present in the gas. Um, so the hotter it is, the more water molecules there tend to be around. I mean, this is, you're familiar with this in the world of humidities, which I'll come to. But as you increase the temperature of water from, from just, just above melting to just below boiling, what you're doing is you're just increasing the rate at which water molecules are coming off the surface. If you want to keep the water around, you have to balance it by sending them back. So you need to have more and more water molecules in the gas. If you don't, you're going to lose if you don't have more water molecules in the gas, you're going to start losing liquid water for gaseous water, and that is evaporation. So evaporation is when the, the leaving rate dominates over the landing rate, you lose liquid water, you gain gaseous water, and the, wa the liquid water disappears gradually. Uh, it also, this also requires the addition of a large amount of thermal energy. Why? Because in turning liquid water into gaseous water, you have to pay that energy cost of separating the molecules. So evaporation consumes thermal energy from its environment. And you're familiar with this as you get water on yourself on a day when there are not too many water molecules in the air to, to, to cause a, a large landing rate. You lose the leaving rate winds and the water disappears. And with it, a lot of thermal energy disappears, typically from you. So you feel cooled by this. So that's why, that's why we perspire is it's a way of uh, 
taking away thermal energy from us and allowing us to cool ourselves below the local temperature. If we were in thermal equilibrium with the, the temperature on a hot summer day in, in, a, in some, some of the hot areas of the world, we would cook. It would not be pleasant. We need to actually keep our bodies cooler than the environment. How do we do that? We give away thermal energy to water, which then and let it evaporate. And the, the water carries away that energy. Actually, it's chemical potential energy. Once the water molecules are separated from, other, from one another, they have a chemical potential energy associated with, with their ability to release it. They can release it by sticking together and becoming liquid again. So evaporating water gives them the, the chemical potential energy and letting them condense back into liquid releases that chemical potential energy. All right, so um, associate with you know, th things around this. Uh, if you block evaporation by putting a container around the, the uh, so, so, so you, you're covered with water and it's really hot, you're trying to sweat away the water. Ah, and if we, if we wrap you up in, in plastic, <laughs> all the, the late night commercials, how to lose more weight, wrap yourself up in plastic, great. What, what you're doing then is you're blocking the, the water molecules that go off as gas from you. Instead of going out into the great outdoors and just leaving, they're stuck right near your surface and they accumulate with, so that the, the vapor density, the density of, of, uh, of gaseous water molecules in the vapor gets higher and higher and higher and that increases the landing rate. And eventually you can't evaporate anything anymore because every water molecule that, that takes off from the liquid is replaced by one landing from this now very dense vapor trapped around you, and there's no net evaporation. You don't lose heat that way anymore. Nothing to carry away the heat, you get hot. I mean, this is not a good idea. People will sell you anything. Um, more appropriate, uh, apropos of cooking, if you leave the lid off the pot and you've got the hot water, soup, whatever, it's likely to be losing molecules faster than they're re returning, so it's going to be carrying away, the liquid's going to be shrinking and carrying away with it thermal energy in the form of chemical potential as the, as the individual water molecules head out. So it's harder to heat the soup up because some of the energy you're putting in is going not into raising the temperature, but into evaporating water molecules, okay? If you put the lid on, you trap the water molecules. They can't leave anymore. They accumulate and they begin to land faster and faster and faster until they balance uh, the leaving rate. And so you no longer lose heat to evaporation. You, you've shut down evaporation, stopped it. Okay? Uh, I should say something about condensation. If you begin to, if you make the, uh, the vapor that was in equilibrium with uh, 100 degree water, pick whatever, seven, 90 degree water, just you know, the units don't matter, whether it's Fahrenheit or Car 90 degree water, you, you've, got, you've got water vapor that is dense enough to land as fast as the water molecules are leaving. If you take that gas and you bring it over and you put it in cold, a cold environment at 50 degrees in whatever units you want, that, that steam is too dense now to be in equilibrium with liquid water at 50 it's going to land more often than it leaves, and it's going to accumulate liquid water. It's going to condense. So you've all seen condensation. Whenever you take very humid air, air, air that's rich with water molecules, and it would be in equilibrium with very hot water, and you bring that air into a cold environment, it's got too many water molecules to be in equilibrium with the local liquid water. It's going, it's over, it's, it, will, it will accumulate more liquid water. It will turn most of its water molecules into liquid water. Is that okay? So that's the world of, of evaporation and condensation. Evaporation, when, when the leaving rate wins and you lose liquid water. Condensation, when the landing rate wins and you gain liquid water. And they all both involve energy because it takes energy to evaporate water and energy is released when steam condenses into water. So where does where's boiling fit into this? Boiling is actually not a new phase transition. It's just evaporation. It's still water going from liquid to gas. But in normal evaporation, the only 
surface at which this exchange of molecules occurs, the landing and leaving, is the top surface of the water. If you hit the boiling temperature, something new happens. You can have bubbles of pure steam inside the liquid water, and they will be stable. And you can get boiling. So, so what's, what's the story here? If you, suppose there were, you've got a, a tub of water here, and it's, I don't know, it's, a, it's, not, it's below boiling temperature. I struggle with picking numbers and, and units. I, I go crazy with this, okay? It's below boiling temperature, and you create a steam bubble right in the middle. That is a bubble containing no air, just pure water vapor. Well, that water vapor will very quickly uh, get into balance with the liquid. They'll exchange molecules. You know, the water will, will send some water molecules at the, at the water vapor. The water vapor will send some molecules at the, at the liquid water. They'll exchange, and they'll quickly reach equilibrium. And the, water, and the vapor that's in that bubble will have just the right density to match the leaving rate from the liquid to the gas. You'll have a certain density there. And it won't, with that density will come a pressure. And the pressure inside that bubble will be less than atmospheric pressure. There are not enough water molecules in that volume of bubble to support atmospheric pressure, some, some quarter of atmospheric pressure, some, you know, somewhere in that range, whatever. The result is you've got atmospheric pressure on the outside, high pressure, low pressure in the bubble. It smashes the bubble out of existence. The, 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 the surfaces are just going to come in and just crush the bubble to nothing. So a bubble isn't stable at ordinary temperatures. A bubble of pure steam, it condenses into nothing. I mean, we, can, we can walk through it. As the bubble shrinks, the vapor gets more dense, it loses water molecules to the liquid, and it becomes less dense, and then it gets crushed more, and then it, it's, it's endless, it's hopeless. The bubble gets smashed out of existence. It is only when the temperature of the water reaches the boiling temperature, when the rate at which of evaporation is so fast into the bubble that it's able to, to that, that the density of water in the bubble at which it's in equilibrium with the water, liquid water, that, that density corresponds to a pressure of atmospheric pressure. The bubble is, the steam bubble that is stably in, in balance with the liquid water has atmospheric pressure and is not smashed. It survives in this environment. Okay? So you have to get up to that temperature before you can have a bubble of pure steam live and survive inside the, the container. And once that happens, now evaporation can occur not only at the top surface of the pot, but into every bubble. So the bubbles are there, and they actually grow. As you add heat, you make the bubbles bigger. And so what happens with boiling is not that it's, new, it's a new phase transition. It's just a dramatic increase in boiling, uh, in evaporation. It's evaporation not only from the top, but also into every bubble that ever exists inside the liquid. Um, so, so, you know, at what temperature does this occur? Well, it turns out this temperature depends on air pressure. If the atmospheric pressure is normal, what we're used to at sea level atmospheric pressure, then you have to get to about 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius for these steam bubbles to become stable. But if the air pressure is less, because you're in Denver or Mexico City or on Mount Everest, then there's less inward crush on the bubbles. They don't have to be as dense. And you don't have to be as hot to make bubbles that are dense enough to survive against the crush of atmospheric pressure, because it's a weaker crush. So water boils at lower temperature at high altitudes, or, or, or alternatively on uh, days when the barometric pressure is low. And we can go to the extreme. So here's water that's at room temperature. So, you know. I do not have asbestos fingers. So it's just ordinary room temperature water. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expose it to vacuum. And I want to use liquid nitrogen to trap the water, because otherwise, I, I don't want the, the water vapor to go in the pump. It's, it's not good for it. So we're, we're taking out the air. Around the, the water, 
Now it's easier for steam bubbles to survive. They don't have to be as dense as before. And it should boil at room temperature without much trouble. Getting close. So it, it's, it's just starting to boil. It's true boiling water. It, it is, it, it's experiencing evaporation, and it is evaporating into steam bubbles in the, in the water. It's still at room temperature. In fact, it's cooling because as it evaporates more aggressively, it's using energy to evaporate. It needs energy to break for the molecules to separate. It's actually cooling by evaporation, so it's now colder than, than room temperature, and yet it is boiling. So public service announcement aspect of this is we use boiling water temperature to cook certain things. When you boil an egg, what you're doing is you're exposing the egg to a certain temperature. 100 degrees Celsius is what you expect. But if you're at high altitude, the water boils more easily. You're not exposing the egg to the temperature you expected. And it won't cook as fast. So there are high altitude uh, instructions for cooking many things, including a lot of, uh, you know, you, if you look on boxes, you can find the high altitude instruction. It's how to adjust various cake mixes and stuff. So that's real boiling water happens to be boiling at, ro at room temperature. Um, you know, I can let the, let the air back in, boiling stops. And I can show you that it's, that it's ordinary. Now, that, this idea that water, once, once you reach the right temperature that water boils, uh, assumes that bubbles are there. That you can evaporate, once, once you get to the right temperature, if there's a bubble present, the surface of that bubble is special, and water molecules can enter the bubble by evaporation and make the bubble grow as a steam bubble. But who makes the bubbles to start with? And toward that end, I wanted to show you a video that's getting older every day. How do I get sound on this sucker? I have no idea how to get the sound on this. <sighs> Dangerous explosion in your kitchen. This is actually a story suggested to us by one of you in a letter over the internet. And it involves a bizarre phenomenon. Before you use your microwave again, you really ought to see what Chris Cuomo found in this primetime owner's manual. At about this time last year, Patty and Dave Long of Naperville, Illinois, were preparing for Easter. It was Good Friday. The kids were off school. Time to make Jell-O Easter eggs. Patty put the water in the microwave for three minutes to boil, but something seemed wrong. No bubbles. So I hit the ad 30 seconds, and I stood and watched it. But it wasn't boiling, and I thought, well, you know, it's got to be boiling. I so I, something has to be wrong. Patty had been using a microwave for years. She was confused. So I opened it up, I brought the container out, and I just kind of brought it down like this, so I was gonna touch it with my right hand, and before I got my right hand there, I heard this like whoosh, and I got hit with all that water into my face. It exploded. It exploded like a bullet, and it just hit the ceiling too. There was no water left in the cup. Patty had first and second degree burns all over her face, even worse. The corneas of her eyes had been scalded. The whole eye was burned, and they were swollen on the inside, so it was blocking some of the vision because of the swelling inside the eye from the heat. Were you afraid that you may have gone blind? Yeah, I was afraid I'd never see my kids again. It would take six months of treatment for Patty to fully recover her sight. Still, no one could explain what had caused this accident. It really wasn't until I got home and saw the water on the ceiling that I, I really understood that something strange had gone on here, something that, that I'd certainly never heard of before. People who have these sorts of accidents are probably <laughs> reluctant to talk about them because it seems so bizarre and so unlikely. Who would ever expect water 
the safest thing we can imagine to come up and hurt us. Let us show you what happens in slow motion. Water heated past boiling more than 212 degrees can erupt. Marianne Ostermeyer says it happened to her too. A middle school teacher in Southern California, she'd been using a microwave oven for nearly 20 years. She says she had been cooking homemade soup on low power for 50 minutes. Remember, low power. Well, I, I ended up grabbing two hot pads. I opened up the microwave. I had one on the handle. I took and poured a small amount of soup in the cup. Then I reached in to the utensil drawer. I picked up a fork. This was, by this time, it was sitting down. I took the edge of the fork or the tip of the fork, put it in, and the next thing I knew, there was this incredible sound, like a gunshot or a backfire of a car. And immediately, there was an explosion. I mean, the whole thing just exploded. What was the extent of the injuries? First degree burns on the face, first degree burns on the wrist, and on the um, top section of the chest region. First degree, the lower quadrant of the left breast, third degree burns. Third degree burns? Yeah. Both Marianne Ostermeyer and Patty Long's husband, David, searched for answers and found them here a website by University of Virginia physicist <laughs> Lewis Bloomfield. It features video of an experiment that looked painfully familiar. I probably get more questions about microwave ovens than all the other questions I get combined. I, just to give you a sub, the problem was you, you can heat water very hot in a microwave oven in glass containers without starting the bubbles. The, getting those bubbles started is hard and not re reliable, and I, I'll, I'll talk about this more on, what, Friday. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. for a little while, I was the world's expert on superheated water.